So my cocktail of choice is going to be a espresso soaked rye. We're going to mix it with some raw milk and maple syrup. On this webisode, we're going to be chatting with Colin of Wasiosha Wood. I mean, just it's like almost like eggnog, but coffee. Sounds good to me. I could drink three or four of these. A filmmaker and self-proclaimed city boy who was on the verge of burnout moved him and his family to the big woods of Minnesota. Let's hear his story. Hi, I'm Paul Grenier. This is Whiskey and Wood. Bring in the people, the stories, and the success to you. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, and these guys and gals are out to get a piece of it. Why Whiskey and Wood? Why not? What do you want to talk about, bud? You. I want to talk about you. I want to talk about how you started, your story. I want to hear about film Colin in the city getting burnt out, chasing your dream, ending up in Wasioja, Minnesota. And when you called me for the first time, I thought you were crazy. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, he's like, I'm a film guy, eclectic. Like, is he the real deal? And then the first time you called me, you FaceTimed me. And um, I was like, what, who is this guy? And then here you are, you're killing it, man. You're doing better than most of the brand new companies that I've seen out there. I was, I was storytelling in Portland as a director and creating content, um, running a creative agency for about eight years. Be previous to that, I was directing music videos, shooting commercials down at Hollywood. Um, met my wife up in Oregon and kind of needed a change of scenery. We got married and um, bought a house and started a family. And I uh, kind of got into the creative marketing realm through my storytelling back, through making film. So um, fast forward to COVID era and, uh, you know, I was scaling a business at the time, trying to build like an episodic type show company to build shows for Netflix and Apple and Hulu. And um, just a lot of companies weren't biting. And I, the marketing was like waiting on other people to pay me to do work. And um, we were living in the city and just, like I wasn't getting my hands dirty doing any projects. I was just kind of waiting on people on the computer. So I made a show, an episodic documentary show on four makers. I finished the show as about almost like a feature length documentary material. And the key pivotal point of the show was these makers taking a dream, solving a problem and going out there and doing it. And I was like, I, I was wired for this. I was meant for making things with my hands, but I'm sitting here just like telling stories about other people that make things. And you wanted to be the person. I was like engulfed in this process of watching someone make furniture, someone make a coffee maker, someone make um, one of the, the characters was like a top chef and she, she made these amazing desserts and these amazing dishes. And I was just like, I'm telling stories about people making things. Why am I not making things? So. Um, my wife and I had an opportunity to um, relocate our family to be closer to family. We were kind of isolated in Portland. Um, we bought land um, and kind of thought we'd do the whole, you know, off-grid homestead thing um, close to family. So we jumped at that that opportunity. And I think at the time, like lumber prices were just going through the roof. And I was curious about buying a sawmill just to make a dang fence. I was like, if I own the sawmill, I can make a fence cheaper than going to Home Depot. So it started down that rabbit hole. And of course, I don't know how many people you've interviewed that have that same path, but everyone who bought a sawmill that in day two was like, crap, this is a ton of work. <laughs> and so I just started cutting lumber. I didn't care about the work. I just was cutting it. And then I, then I started thinking like, oh, I guess it's dry if you air dry it, right? So I just started doing all this research. Fast forward and I'm starting a wood business and I'm going full tilt, really thinking how I can actually make this a profitable business. And it was really in the research I did around air drying versus kiln drying and the value of wood. Once it's kiln dried properly, 
I was like sold. And so then I started thinking, all right, am I buying a, a, a dehumidification system? Am I building a solar kiln? I looked into all the options, read hours and hours and hours and hours of data and forums and like just watching videos of folks. And I got to the point where I was like, I am not going to spend the next six months to a year of my life building a kiln because I've never built a kiln before, but I will go buy one and next week I'll be turning a profit. Yeah, absolutely. So first, I plan to dry my own material. And I was stuffing the kiln week after week after week after week. I, I had been sitting on probably five to 8,000 board feet of walnut that I'd cut on my own property. And so I started drying that. And as I got closer to like week 12, I was like, I need to find a way to like keep this kiln busy because I'm not cutting nearly enough to keep it booked every week for the next, you know, umpteen years. So then I just started reaching out to different folks and um, I found a few furniture makers that were uh, really into drying cookies. And I like, what did I call it? I dry cookies. You're like, I don't know. They're going to crack. They're going to break. It's not going to be good. So I told the client that he's like, sign me up. I'll drive for the next like six weeks. I like cracks. I like epoxy. I like bow ties. So, so it was like my first drying client was a guy with a crap ton of cookies and they all turned out amazing. His tables are beautiful. Um, Lake Ambler works, a guy to check out, uh, making beautiful cookies, uh, cookie tables. And he does uh, some slab tables as well, but he uses all antlers for his bases. So he was my first um, drying client. And when he came in the door, I had just been only drying slabs. So I had no idea how to dry cookies, but I got some recommendations from you, Paul, from Kevin, um, uh, up in Minneapolis who owns Wet Rock Co. And then from Brian Kingsbury. So I had some good advice. And then after that first client, I had, I really had a taste for like drying for other folks. I liked the service of drying. I liked like meeting the client, getting to hear about their work, taking a delivery of their wood, navigating it into the kiln, navigating the kiln checks, all the progress updates. Hey, your material's at 12.5. We're getting closer. Oh, it's at like nine. You want to keep going. You want to get it to seven to eight. You want it to stick in the nine to 10 range. Where are you at? I just like that back and forth customer service of running that business. And then um, it just really took off. And then, um, and then after, I don't know, like a few months, I was just like, I guess I'm running a kiln, you know, drying business. And so I made an ad for you guys at I dry just as like a testimonial, just because I love the darn thing so much. I was like, I got to make something to help them sell more of these. They're really cool. And I want more people to know how to, uh, how to make money um, doing something that they love. So um, kept, kept drying for folks and then uh, really got, really got plugged into the I dry community and have found that there's just been such a good support network. So I branched out into just drying bigger, thicker, longer, um, and learning how to do that well and do it safely where I'm not, you know, salvaging, you know, 1500 board feet of white oak. I, I, uh, I have a lot of drying stories that we can jump into, but that's kind of the high level, uh, story of how I got here. Um, and I guess, um, the rest of the podcast, we can talk about like, what the heck am I doing now? And where do I go? You know, when, uh, I don't know if the, the catchphrase is still taken when you hear your family, but really when you become part of the I dry community, it, it is like a family. We text back and forth. If you got a question, you know, I'm a phone call away and always happy to chat and see what you're doing. And, you know, speaking sometimes of sometimes at that, the wrong time of day, <laughs> but look at that beautiful walnut behind you. Did you know when you moved to that cabin, was one of your thoughts, hey, this place is loaded with black walnut, like I'm moving and I'm going to harvest these trees? Or were you like, you got here and you're like, whoa, those are black walnut trees. Those are those are worth some money because I see some of the most beautiful story is we put an offer in on the property. Once it was accepted, I got a note from the seller saying, I'm taking six trees off the property. Wanted you to know this operation has been in place since before I decided to sell. You're welcome to jump out of the deal if that's a breaker, um, but they won't be, you know, they won't be uprooting like a massive tree stand. They're not going to be creating any damage. We're putting in a new septic system. It's all going to be amazing. It's not going to create any detriment to the property. And I was like, sure, go ahead. That's fine. No big deal. Like you should be able to benefit from your wall that's on your property. And at the time I was like, that'd be interesting. Like if I could make a business cutting wood off my own property over the next, you know, decade of owning it. 
So when I got here, I found out, oh, he only got 600 bucks a tree. I started running the numbers. I thought, well, if I own the mill and the chainsaw, I can find a way to safely take those tree down, trees down. Well, then I can mill it and dry it. And then that 200 board feet in that one tree or 300 board feet might yield 1500 bucks. So that's like a three X increase. But then when I started to run the numbers, when it was kill dry, I was just blown away. I was like, if I can sell that same 200 board feet for $15 a foot and make three grand, you know, here we go. Now we're um, talking. And then I have 600 trees. That's a great deal. Um, so I just started to like get further and further down the like, how many parts of the process could I own? But I had no clue when I moved here, how to drop a tree. I'd never operated a chainsaw in my life. <laughs> That's awesome. And then you didn't go to the ER once. <laughs> They are only once. It's not bad. Only once. I could I could pull the pants off to show you the scar, but it's like a gnarly, like five inches on my right above my kneecap. I missed the main artery, and uh, we were like we were like a three quarter inch or like a half inch deep. I was cutting down an ash tree in my backyard, and I was just bucking the lumber, like just you know the last part of the job. And I just wasn't being careful. I didn't wear my chaps. It was a hot day. To anyone watching this podcast, if you are not wearing chaps, just get out of get out of this business. Like you're just risking your life. You're risking your safety. Um, it's not worth it. I mean, just wear the chaps. Like if send me a personal message, I'll send you a link to the chaps that I bought. They're Husqvarna's. They're great. They'll they'll save you. Um, just go do some research and protect yourself. But anyway, I had no clue. I had I had no idea. So I bought a chainsaw off Facebook. Just started dropping trees, watching YouTube videos and had a few guys out that I knew that I trusted that had a lot of experience and just watched them. Had one guy out, we dropped six wallets in my backyard. I milled them, dried them. And I sold all that lumber to my first hardwood retailer um, over the course of last summer. They, they couldn't buy, like I didn't have enough. They were like, we'll keep buying from you as long as you want to produce this. You told me a funny story about that hardwood retail. Yeah, I've had other shops that were like, this is the most beautiful like FAS walnut I've ever seen. Like just gorgeous color, amazing sap uh, vibrancy, sapwood vibrancy, um, just beautiful mineral tones. So it, it's been cool to like go from super amateur, not knowing nothing to like producing wood at a level that would rival, you know, people in the business for 30, 50 years. Yeah. And, and you told me that story. Now bring me back. Before the kiln was delivered, you went and visited a hardwood retailer and you're like, hey, I have walnut on my property. I'm going to be harvesting it. I'm going to be drying it in a vacuum kiln. And didn't they say something like, we don't buy wood from vacuum kilns or something along that line? Or yeah, so January of last year, about a year ago, I had my sights set on buying an iDry. I had a deposit in with iDry. I was ready to receive, deliver, like ready to basically push, you know, push it to like, here's the delivery date. You were working with me on that. And... So I was calling around and trying to get essential buy-in on retail customers. And I called one specific hardwood retailer that was really well known in my area. They've been in business since, uh, I want to say like 1950, 1960. And really uh, a great resource for hardwood. They're direct to the tradesmen. Um, and tradeswomen where they're just selling right to the contractors and the people putting that they're not like more of a lumber retailer to the public, the general public, you could go in, but they were like, no, we won't buy wood from a vacuum kiln. We buy from a steam kiln and the, the loads are typically in the like 10 to 50,000 board feet. So we're not going to touch, you know, a thousand, 2000, 3000 feet, a kiln load from a small guy like yourself. And so I said, all right, well. Great. Thanks for the advice. Um, I, I did ask him like all the specifics of why they did dry steam and what about it was good for walnut. It's all they knew. <laughs> and so I just like, I just tried to listen to them and just understand like, what was the reason behind that? And then I was like, well, it sounds like they just have never bought from a vacuum killed. And if I showed them an amazing product, they probably would buy from me. So I just was convinced that if I went in the door Six months later, eight months later, they buy from me. And I just, I didn't let that stop me. I got the kiln, I got set up and I walked in the door last summer 
um, I had been calling them, you know, like, hey, I, I'm getting the kiln in two weeks. You want to meet up in a little bit? They're like, yeah, we'd love to see product. And then I called them and was like, hey, I just got wood out of the kiln. Like, you ready to meet up? And they're like, yeah, call us next week. So then I called them the next week. I'm like, hey, I've got the wood. I'm ready to come over. And they're like, yep, just, uh, just, just bring it on up. And then they call, and then I called them again. I was like, Hey, just so you, just so you're aware, like, here's what I'm seeing in my grading. I'm not a lumber grader. Like they're like, well, you know, why don't you put all the, the boards that fit the fit kind of that a and better, or, um, like more on the, more on the clear side, um, uh, like an FAS grade or select and better. They said, put all those in one pile. We'll probably look at buying or we'll, we'll look at them. Like, they still weren't convinced. Um, and then I put aside all the other boards kind of thinking these aren't even selected better. And it, and I had to have had maybe only 500 board feet. I felt a little embarrassed. I was like, I didn't have a lot out of it. It was in the thickness that they wanted. They wanted, um, a crap ton more of, of six quarter and eight quarter. In my first runs, I was drying pretty much like four quarter to six quarter. Um, but it's still beautiful stuff. So anyway, I put it all aside. I had maybe only 200 board feet of eight quarter and I had like 150 board feet of six quarter. And then I had a few hundred feet of, of four quarter. I showed up and, um, the main guy is looking at the wood. He's testing it with a moisture meter. He's like just silent for the first, like maybe five, 10 minutes looking at the wood. And he's just like, the first thing that comes out of his mouth, he goes, I have to be honest. This is, this is, this is the opposite of what I expected. I was kind of just, you know, I've had sawmill guys come in, killing guys come in. And like, I'm actually like really impressed with the quality. And he's like, I just, I'm surprised. Like I wasn't expecting to buy any lumber from you, but now I, I kind of want to buy all of it. And so then his dad comes in, really respectful gentleman who built this company from scratch. He's in his probably nineties and he's looking at it kind of like, Kind of like, oh, I don't know about that. Like vacuum kill, you know, all these hesitations. And the main guy, um, his son, also just an amazing guy to work with. Is like, you know, like give it, let's let's look at it, let's test it with what we know about our quality standards of walnut. And and then and then he starts talking about live edge, and he's like, we would never buy a Ford with live edge on it. And I was like, I totally get it. Like you don't you don't sell live edge currently. You haven't seen the demand, but I was like, it's out there and you can choose to get on that train or not. And it, it will take time to develop that customer. But I, I was like, you know, I'm just what people ask for these days. And, and you're going to get customers if you start carrying it. So, so I go there with all that wood and basically like the, the, at first it was just kind of this, like build the relationship meeting. It wasn't like I'm going to go there and actually do a deal. But then he, he basically, by the end of the meeting says like, well, how much do you have of this thickness? How much do you have of this, this thickness? Um, and, uh, so I went back home, I got all of it. I showed up and they bought every board I brought. They, and, and they bought 200 feet of live edge and they'd never bought live edge ever. Yeah. So it was really cool. And then they commissioned some larger slabs that were kind of show pieces um, to, to just show off to, to the different customers. So it was really cool to have that, like, oh, wow, this is actually really good quality. And we're impressed with, with the wood beyond what we expected, you know, we would be. And, and I think that's a greatest, that's an awesome story. And really there's so many people who haven't experienced a vacuum kiln because forever those steam kilns, that older gentleman that you mentioned, that's always ever seen, that's always ever known. And he may have heard a few stories about vacuum kilns. And you know, the old saying, good news travels slow, bad news travels fast. So until you see the quality of the wood and feel it, they had to have it. They had to buy it. Oh yeah. And I, and I believe me, they were like, you know, they gave me the numbers and they were like, here's what we buy um, quarterly or annually. And if I could find the right log source, I might, I might be able to be doing, you know, 10 to 15,000 feet a year with them, but it's just a matter of walnut in my area, unless I'm taking it off my own property, it's hard to get it at a price that, that gives me enough of a markup to sell in that quantity to make it worth the effort. I go by the Ed Parsons rule, like make it $10 buck a board foot profit. And he, I mean, he's kind of my guru in that and, and just like setting the tone of, 
Well, if you're sawing for $5 a foot, sawing and drying, like that's your cost or whatever, and you're only selling it for $10 a foot, you're only making five. And to be doing that every single month, crap ton of work for not much pay. Um, so, so like I have, I'm sitting on that offer, but I just haven't found the right black walnut source where I can make those returns work. Um, it's encouraging to know, like if I could build that system, I've got a buyer. Um, but it's also like, you know, is that, do I want to try to compete with the dimensional mills that are just crushing it, making 10 to, I mean, sometimes even a hundred four hundred thousand board feet a day. It's just, it's, I can't compete with that. I can maybe mill, you know, five to 10,000 on a really long day. Uh, yeah. My goal is, my, my goal is usually like as simple as like, I want to, I want to mill and stack a, a, a whole kiln load every day I, I mill, you know, to get through enough logs to basically have a whole kiln load, mill three to five days a month and fill that kiln, you know, have that kiln filled out for, for three to six months. But I've kind of shifted my business to like less to to less inventory um, heavy because I'm just sitting on a crap ton of inventory. I mean, just to give you a, a picture, we're gonna just give you just the the run of the mill. Like this is just our like rough inventory, and just in in like what hasn't been, this is stuff that has been processed, hasn't gotten shipped out or sold yet. And then I'm sitting on just like, this is all walnut, like from me all the way to the back. This is probably like a thousand, fifteen hundred feet of unsurfaced, um, mostly veneer quality black walnut that's going out to like one customer. But we've just been so inventory heavy and like I haven't been selling enough. Um, I've just been focusing on drying for folks. And then I've taken on some more like custom fabrication jobs in that. That's awesome. So the color in walnut in a vacuum or in a vacuum kiln or in high dry, I hear from a lot of customers is beautiful. It doesn't wash out the color like in a steam kiln. See, look at the the sapwood and the heartwood and that. That's what I feel like a lot of people want to see these days is that transition, the sapwood and the heartwood. And how would you say it is drying? And is it easy to dry walnut in the in the eye dry or? That's beautiful. Look at the figure. To dry an eye dry. You follow the eye dry settings. You just put it in 130 degrees. If it's above 25% moisture, 48 hour cycles or 24 hour cycles. And then once it's below that 25%, I put it 160 degrees, 48 hour cycles. I really don't do much other than that. There's no reason to. There's a lot of guys out there that are like this many weeks at this temp. And then I bump it to this temp. And then I check and then I, I add some water in the kiln and then I, well, I take my daughter's stuffed animal and I put it in there soaking wet and, and then I let that sit until it's kind of molded over and the drain lines are plugged. And then I flush it out with air. I, uh, I, I char all the wood. I put it back in. It's like, I don't, I'm not into that. I just like set it and forget it. Let's move on. You don't need to be, you talked about doing some other stuff and doing, and you're a busy guy. You don't need to be at your house now with the capability of the internet and being able to monitor from your phone. Yeah, I mean, here, let's do it. Let's do it. Can we can we share screen? Here we go. We could do screen and then let me get um let's do this. Do you want me to share the the screen? I'll just show you what I'm drying right now where we're at. All right, so I can log into my kiln remotely while I'm on an edit job or I'm on a sawmill job, I'm away from the kiln. Um, work in film production as kind of my like main job. Um, some weeks I, I like don't have the opportunity to be in front of the kiln, but I can just log in. I can go and connect and see how's my, how's my temp looking? How are my drain cycles? Um, uh, are we, do we need to bump up to a 48 hour? Do we need to take it down to 24? Do we need to bump up the temp? There's just so many things you can do just remotely with the kiln now. Um, so I can go in and like, take a look at how's my seven day cycle on this batch at five quarter walnut. Um, you know, here's where we entered, um, the new batch, you know, we jumped right in. It took a day to get us up to 140. Um, and then if we go all the way over, we're sitting in the 140 to 160 zone right now. And that load should be ready to pull in the next two to four days. So it's pretty cool. 
I love that you can um, do all the functionality of the main control panel right from your phone. On your website, you said you're looking for limitless exploration and creation. What does that look like? Um, buying land, learning how to do things with my hands, finding it unlimited amount of projects and ways to solve problems. I think like, you know, living in the city um, has so many benefits. You can walk to a grocery store, you can walk to a friend's house, you've got daycare, you've got, uh, you know, a church nearby. You don't have to go super far for anything you need. But it also, those conveniences tie you, they tie your hands to this like comfort lifestyle and everything at the tips of, of your fingers. It's like, you don't have to do a lot of work for yourself if you don't want to. Um, when you live in the woods, I live in a log cabin. We heat our cabin with heat. I'm out there at 8 p.m. filling a, a stack of lumber into a, a little hopper and then we're loading the wood stove or I'm waking up at 6 a.m. on the or 4 a.m. on those really cold negative 20 degree days and stoking the stove to keep the house above 65. So it's like the the work then rather than it being this comfort mindset, it's like this like um it's like this satisfying like I'm gonna do it for myself and I'm gonna put in the work to enjoy the benefit. Owning a kiln in and of itself is a project. It's a lot of work. You have to put in the time to make the return. Um, but I can give you an example over the summer. I spent, you know, a week, I spent a week with my family and my friends up at our, up, up in a cabin on an island. I, I didn't do a day of work. I didn't think of any customers. I just had to kill them running and someone was paying me money. So the simplicity of that as a business where someone drops off their lumber and they pay me to put it in the dryer and then they pay me when they pick it up. And all I had to do was four hours of work to like load it in the kiln, check the kiln, unload the kiln and put it on their trailer to make, you know, a couple thousand bucks. I don't think there's many other jobs out there that'll pay you that rate per hour. Earlier, you spoke about how much satisfaction it gives you providing these services to the people in this community around this woodworking. <clears throat> Why is it? Why is it that you find this connection with these people so rewarding? Um, I think the drive in serving the woodpreneur, the hobbyist, the DIYer, the woodworker, furniture maker, cabinet shop, the drive is in their pursuit of creativity. Just like I found a lot of passion and purpose in making an episodic series about makers, it's like the same thing now. I get to produce wood for someone that they get to take that and make something beautiful. I get to take that wood and also make beautiful things. I finished my first tree to table project. I picked up a log on a cu customer's property. I milled it. I dried it in the eye dry. I produced dimensional and live edge lumber out of it. And I built uh, probably... I mean, for the fact that it was my first table, one of the best tables I've ever made. And then the fact that it was just a gorgeous piece of art, like the client was super happy. I've got an order for three more tables already. And um, I think the fact that you just get to turn this raw material, that being trees, into a gorgeous piece of wood that someone can then have that living in their house for ages and ages to come. Think of it as like a, everyday kind of ordinary elegance and that they get to take something that could have just been cut down and thrown in the flames or chipped and they get to turn it into a dining table that then they get to have memories when they're older of eating with their kids or um, meeting their spouse um, for the first date, like it, having them over and they're, they're, they're enjoying a dinner at this piece of, you know, furniture that was made for them or by them. Uh, there's a lot of purpose in that in that possibility of what every piece could generate that comes out of the kiln. And so, you know, you're, we're this <clears throat> filmmaker helping them by sharing their story uh, of all these creators, but now you're a creator who is still helping those creators, but you get to fulfill your need and desire 
to make something and to be a, a part of that process. And it's just an awesome story. For sure. It's a humbling thing. You know, then what, like any person who has bought an eye dry or wants to buy an eye dry, you have this kind of thought in your head of like what I could turn wood into if it was kiln dried. And then you get the kiln and then you dry the wood and you're sitting on the wood and you can't make enough projects to, to like make that wood go away. Like you can make so much wood in a short amount of time. So it's a humbling thing to be sitting on so much gorgeous wood that was dried properly that could now be turned into something amazing. Um, I did my first project, like I mentioned, and I realized pretty quickly, like, I am not going to be a woodworker for the rest of my life. It is hard work, takes a lot of skill. It takes a ton of different tools, one that I don't imagine spending all my time just like cutting things and sanding things and gluing things. Uh, but what I do love doing is like this, this idea of here's what could be selling that to a customer and then bringing all the pieces together to make that idea happen. So the way I look at it now is if I can produce that amazing lumber and then employ or hire, um, the talent to make the wood pieces, that's, that's the now the reality that I'm sitting at. Cause I could, I could go and make, um, I'm, I'm sitting in order for like three dining tables and a few mantles, a few side tables, a coffee table and, and like a set of benches from one customer. And it's from a, from like a collection of trees that they had on their property, white oak and cherry. And I could easily fulfill all that work. Um, it's going to be 80 to a hundred plus hours per project or per table, at least just looking at the dining tables. But what if I could do the part that I have really honed in on, which is the milling and the drying and creating the beautiful lumber and then bringing those makers along in the process, because it's easy to get into the mindset where you can do everything. And with, with an eye dry, you really can, like you can go cut the tree down. You can slab it with a friggin' chainsaw for all I care. Then you can dry it. Then you can make that, you know, table. Um, but the beauty is when you then are empowering other people's dreams. So I guess where I'm at is that humbling reality that like I could try to do it all. Um, there's a burnout period again, just like running a creative agency, making videos and like trying to do it all. So the passion that now I'm chasing is like, how can I turn the side business that has become a full-time business, um, very easily into a way to have regular income and regular opportunity of creating wood for others and letting them do the magic of, of making things. So would you say you feel a sense of pride and integrity working with these craftsmen and material that was harvested off of your land that's going to be used for generations? Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's cool to get a call and say, Hey, we have these, eight trees that are going to go to the dump. Like, do you want them? They drop them off. And then a couple of months later, I'm sending them pictures of like, here's what it got milled into. Here's how it got dried. Here's the slabs as they turn down. Here's an end product. Um, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. It's like, it's, it's, it gives me a lot of pride to know that we're doing justice to those, uh, potentially detrimental actions that would just be created by just burning a material with no end benefit. You know, um, I think, I think there's pride in my own, um, family to know, like we took a tree down that was, that was diseased, um, in the way had gotten bruised by like, you know, deer just running and brushing up against it. And it's not going to survive for the long haul. We took it, we mailed it, we dried it and we sold it into a, a form that's going to go in someone's house, you know, and, and create beauty for, you know, generations. I think there's a lot of pride in that, especially knowing like half of the stuff I've milled and dried has come from my own property. That's been pretty cool to be like, this is Wasioja wood. And this is something that is heirloom for you and your family and generations to come. What is the one takeaway or key takeaway that any advice you'd give a guy who wants to go down this path? Like what's a lesson learned that you could pass on to them? Good question. Um, well, the first lesson is don't buy a kiln without a plan to put a shed over it. 
Okay. Good luck. I spent, all of, I spent all of my fall basically retroactively building a shed around the kiln versus just building the shed and putting the kiln in it. Um, don't ask me how to fit two by six walls that are like 30 feet long next to a kiln with a gap of six inches between your other shop. It's just, it's almost impossible. Um, so the real recommendation though would be, uh, one, yeah, plan ahead. So don't just buy the kiln and then come up with the plan later. Really plan out all the steps, write a business plan, write out your customer base, who you're going to actually call, go, go spend, you know, a few hours a week, just calling prospected sawyers and cabinet shops in the area, really test the market. I bought a kiln in a market where I knew within essentially like a, a 60 mile or a 50 mile, like circle. I was the only person with a kiln in it. Um, w within a major city of like 200 plus thousand, um, there's no other eye dry owners. Um, the other thing you could do is go meet with other eye dry owners. I have found the best benefit and the best return in everything I've done from knowing two key eye dry owners in the eye dry network and just asking them questions, being their friend and, and learning from them. So um, if you want to buy an iDry, you can call me personally. My number is 507-261-8114. I'm the second guy that you should call. Paul is the first guy you should call. <laughs> but I should be the second, and I'll talk like, to you through it. Um, and I can help you through every step of the process, just in understanding how to build a business of it. Um, but yeah, do a, do, do a business plan. Um, I wanted to pay my kill loss in a year. Like my goal was to to... to to pay it outright with cash and then pay it, pay it down and essentially like reimburse myself, um, within a, a year. And I'm, I'm, uh, I bought the kiln in last May. Um, and my target payoff is like this coming April. So we're, we're doing okay. There we go. One year return on investment for what is that called? A hundred percent return on investment at least. Yes. That's a, that is what I call, that it's called, that's amazing. And I see people all the time worried. It, take, it took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of grinding. Nothing was given to you, but you did it. You put your mind to it and you did it and you got that kiln paid back in a year. Can I tell you the honest truth though? Like where I'm at as a business? Yeah. Every month it scares the crap out of me. I mean, it's like every month I'm like, sure, I'm going to make 30 days at 225 bucks a day or 250 or 200, like whatever the rate is based on how full the kiln is and how long, you know, materials going in, um, and how many loads I can get in in a month. But every month I'm like, am I going to make it? But the reality is that I'm not like, I'm not forced to go do anything else right now. Like I, I'm, I'm just doing this. And like a year ago I was just doing this but I wasn't making money. I was, I was doing a little money here and there, but owning an eye dry was like the, the tipping point to actually starting a business. Um, so every month I'm like on the edge, but, but that will, that will change. Like I'm six months in. Um, and so that's something I have to keep in, in like in balance. Like my wife's like, are we going to have enough money this month? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I hope so. Um, but the reality is that like, there's nothing else paying our bills except our eye dry. So that's, that's amazing. I mean, there's not many other tools you can go out and just buy. And then like within a year you've paid it off and pay it and you're paying your bills. Um, so I think, I think that's, that is pretty impressive. And like, you've built an amazing product that allows owners like us to do that. Um, but you also have to grind it out. You have to be on hard work, hard work every day. Like at two o'clock today, I have a call with the city. Um, that I live in or like the, the major city that I live near to. And they have a, a forest waste plan that they've just been essentially dumping their logs. They recently came up with a plan to mill them and dry them into like out, outdoor structures and amphitheaters and high end lumber that they could use to have lead certified projects in the city. So at two o'clock today, I'll find out whether or not I've got three months of drying booked. We'll see. But those types of customers are like the type of people that help us stay in business. You got to get those regular customers and, and, and if not, you're milling your own material, you're drying it, you're selling the heck out of it, or you're, you're charging a premium for that table that you built 
um, from scratch. So, uh, you know, I'm really excited to hear about that uh, contract and that work with the municipality. I think more and more municipalities are starting to look at their waste product and saying, hey, we need to use this for something. Um, and you're the first person that I've spoken to that it's you're on the cusp of as an eye dry owner making that connection and helping them use that wood for those lead certified projects. So I think uh, there's going to be a lot more municipalities and, and cities following suit to what you are already starting to do, which is great. Yeah, I'd say if you're watching this and you're in Minnesota, uh, you should definitely be um, hitting me up for kiln drying services. That's true. Also. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks to you guys. It was, it was great talking with you. Thank you, Colin, for joining us. It was uh, great talking with you. Love your stories and really looking forward to seeing what's to come from Wasiosha Woodworks. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, hey, this is Colin Sabalka. I own Wasiosha Wood and we run an eye dry vacuum kiln and we couldn't be happier. Would love to share more of our story. Get in touch with us if you're curious.